really excited to be here to talk about real-time collaboration with front-end app, uh, applications using a new open source library called Fluid. And before we dive into that, let me introduce Sam actually and uh, have him tell you what he does. How's it going everyone? I am Sam. It's so great to be here. I've been uh, working on the Fluid framework for about three years now as an engineer. Uh, we just open sourced, as Dan said, uh, recently, and we're so excited to show you it. All right. Well, let's dive in, uh, Sam, shall we, to the agenda today? So what we're going to do is, uh, as with any new library, new framework, because let's face it, it seems like every five minutes there's a new library or framework out there, right? Well, this one is uh, super interesting, and I think you're going to find that it's going to provide a lot of flexibility when it comes to real-time collaboration. And so uh, what we're going to talk about here is how we can actually work with real-time collaboration. We're going to introduce what Fluid is. Sam will walk us through that part. Uh, we'll go through some of the building blocks of it. And then from there, we'll get into a demo and we'll, we'll actually show you a few demos along the way that we're gonna do. Uh, from there, we're gonna wrap up talking about the server aspect of Fluid because it is real-time collaboration you know, around the world. So you're gonna have to have a server there. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with how you can contribute or submit ideas and things like that. So Sam, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what is Fluid and why would people be interested in hearing about it? Yeah, of course. So. Uh, I've been on the Fluid team for a little while, and as part of me getting started with Fluid, I was building a bunch of collaborative applications, little things like to-do lists or inking canvases, and uh, we realized that there's a number of problems that need to be solved in this space. And the first is collaboration. It's just not that easy today to build a collaborative application. And the second is portability. You want to write an application once and have it run in multiple services. So that's what we're doing with Fluid. We try to make those two things easier, and I think we've done a pretty good job. Go to the next slide. And uh, one way to think about this is to think about two users like Kevin and Anna who are working on a to-do list. I've made apps like this before, and you may have too for your line of business scenarios. Uh, in this to-do list, it's a simple scenario, but we've got people adding new elements, they're rearranging this to-do list. As a developer, I've got some questions that come to my mind immediately. Like, how am I going to implement this? How am I gonna make sure I get the order right? If I drag, if two users drag the same element at the same time, how do we keep the list in sync? How do we make sure we have a reasonable behavior for our users? And then I've got a second question. Am I gonna have to integrate this to-do list into every application? What if I want to put it uh, into my company's website and another website or into Teams or something else? The portability is challenging too. So we're trying to answer these two things with the Fluid Framework. Uh, we can go to the next, uh, next slide. And um, right, so how do we handle multiple users? Uh, where do we host our application? I was asking questions like this all the time and um, I guess something that, that, that is important to think about is, you know, a lot of the collaborative solutions out there right now, uh, whether it's for uh, like WebSocket, SignalR, uh, you're really still going to have to build a service that's specific to each collaborative application. I'd have to build a, a service just to make this to-do list. And so Fluid tries to solve that problem. That's what we were trying to do, make it easier to spin up a new collaborative experience and we'd have to write that integration code each time instead of just pulling in a library. Anyway, this is why I built Fluid, but Dan, why don't you tell us some of the uh, some of the things you might wanna build with Fluid? What are some of the application types? Take it away. Yeah, so uh, when I first joined Microsoft about five months ago, in fact, that's how I got to know Sam. We've worked quite a bit together over the last five months. And the first question I asked is, well, we have things like SignalR or Socket.io or others that are out there for real-time data. And that I would call that real-time data sharing, not so much collaboration. When we talk about collaboration, we're talking about things like if you've used Google Docs or Word Online or uh, Google Sheets or Excel Online, those, those type of things where you have multiple users that are actually typing in the same word, in the same sentence, 
to build that on your own is actually pretty complex. There's a lot of algorithms that you would have to know about. And we'll talk about some of those actually shortly here. Um, what Fluid will let you do is you literally could collaborate on a single text box if you wanted, if that's what you needed, or you could expand that to a document. Same goes for inking or drawing like on a tablet. Uh, let's say Sam and I are planning, uh, I don't know, Sam, it's not gonna happen in 2020, I don't think, but maybe we're gonna go on a, a Fluid tour. It'll be virtual for now. Oh, uh, it's a dream. Start circling cities, right? Yep. Well, we could collaborate in real time on the inking or the drawing um, and all those strokes and the data would be sent across all the users, synchronized in a very low latency way. Uh, you might want to track user presence, maybe just user cursor locations. That would be a potential uh, option. The one I think a lot of people think of with real-time collaboration is games. And I always joke with Sam that I think a lot of us, you know, that'd be we think that'd be kind of like, yeah, I just want to do that full time. <laughs> but uh, and, and maybe some of you get to. If you do, that's great. Um, but when it comes to games, you need a super low latency way. You know, if you have a shooter game, for example, and you know, every time they press a button or whatever it may be, you need to send over data that synchronizes across potentially hundreds or more users. That gets pretty challenging, actually. And although we can't overcome the speed of light, I'm sure somebody's working on that, but we're not there yet. Um, we can make it so it's very, very low latency as we work with these uh, collaborative scenarios like this. And then the last one that probably a lot of you do work on day to day is line of business scenarios. Um, you have data grids and calendars and agendas and things like that where Sam and I and our team, we all want to collaborate like on an agenda at the same time. And while you could use documents for that, such as again, Google Sheets or uh, maybe Word Online, you know, the problem with that is what if I only want a small part of my app to support that collaboration, right? So we can do that with uh, Fluid. So with that, why don't we uh, show some demos, Sam, and uh, we'll kind of show them how it works here. So let me jump on over and you can get some information about this brand new, it came out in September, um, open source library from fluidframework.com. And one of the key things Sam and I worked on together, this is actually how I got to know him, uh, is through this. We worked on the Fluid Playground. And this is kind of a, a demo site, uh, which is going to be expanded, but this is what we have at this point. And one of the kind of cool demos we like to show that's pretty tricky to do on your own is if we wanted to come in and type at the same time, and Sam and I will show you a live one of this. This is live, but you'll notice these browsers are side by side. Now, as I type hello world, or how about we change it to hello Sam, you'll hello notice Dan. that. Yeah, thanks Sam. <laughs> Instantly, uh, we're gonna get that uh, functionality. And Fluid, as we're gonna talk about coming up, it will automatically merge the changes across many, many collaborators. And that's the tricky part. Um, so like for instance, if we come in and bold, then you know that's gonna be done. Or maybe Sam just italicizes just the O and we want that reflected across everybody and merge. But at the same time, I bolded it. Well, we need all that to apply. And that's where it gets a little bit tricky. And there's, there's a lot more we could show here. If you're interested, because uh, we're gonna move on to some other things, you can actually see the source behind these. This one happens to be a React demo, uh, but you can use Fluid in anything that is JavaScript. So it could be any framework, any library uh, you can think of. We'll also give you a, down here a little summation of what's being used in this demo that's kind of from Fluid. And these are some of the things that Sam and I are gonna walk you through shortly. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. All right, so let's move onward and upward here. Um, so I've already kind of mentioned this collaboration is hard. In fact, Sam, he he's really into reading white papers and I fully predict he's going to be like a you know professor someday or something. But um, Sam may be like, no, nah, I don't think so. But yeah. uh, do you have any aspirations for that, Sam? I mean, I've read all of the papers on that wall over there, but um, <laughs> I don't actually aspire to be a professor, not yet. Okay, well, yeah. I'll, 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 we'll move on then. Um, so there's a lot of different algorithms out there. Uh, one of the more popular ones over the last few years, well, many years actually, is called CRDTs. 
And this is an algorithm for merging collaboration data state. Uh, total order broadcast, which we're going to talk about as we move on. And there's even others. And when you use Google Docs, Word Online, and these types of products, they're actually applying some of these algorithms. Or maybe if you go to really simple algorithms, you might have worked with optimistic or pessimistic uh, concurrency. And you've had to do that because you had like multiple users trying to insert or update data. And that's one way you could do it. Well, now take that to the next level where you could have 100 people trying to do this simultaneously. That's where these algorithms come into play. Now, the beauty of this is you don't have to know these algorithms. In fact, Fluid is going to make it so this just works out of the box. And that's kind of what we're going to talk with you about today. So with that, Sam, why don't you tell them a little bit about uh, the building blocks, I guess, of Fluid, and then we'll uh, jump into a demo in a little bit. Yeah, what I want to do first, Dan, is I want to show everyone the to-do application. Just give a little uh, overview of what that app looks like and uh, go from there. So this is, yeah. uh, Dan's going to switch screens, but we, um, I was like playing around recently and uh, giving a talk, and I put together this, this to-do app, and this is a collaborative to-do application uh, that is actually running on a remote service. I think it's uh, the service is in Europe. Uh, here, let me say hi from Sam. And this now, is I'm a... My hands. I'm not typing, yeah. folks. I'm, Sam's typing. Your, the screen's <laughs> on me, but I was just typing. That was me actually sort of, uh, you know, pushing those keys. I wrote this app. We're running this off of a service uh, in Europe that we'll talk a little bit more about later. But it really only took me a couple of hours to set this up. I built it with React. A lot of the rest of the conversation is going to be focused on integrating with Angular. But I wanted to bring it up because it's a good thing to know. Like, we don't care what uh, view library you come with. We'll work with all of them. The source code for this is online, and uh, and you can find it later. Anyway, we can move on now, and we'll use this as a reference for the next, uh, next bit of the talk. Yeah, and to kind of emphasize there, Sam, so as I type in that text box, you could too, right? Mm. We could actually type Absolutely. at the same time. Yeah, so that prose mirror example, you know, that's an advanced text editor. Um, I love that text editor. We were looking at it on the, the playground site, but we can collaborate here uh, and Dan can add, you know, his own keys here. And, you know, we're typing in the same box. We're working on the same string. And uh, that's the kind of thing where you can get a little fancier with it, but we enable that sort of functionality in an easier way than it's been done before. And we're proud of that. It's, it's an exciting set of features. So let's go to the, the let's key. go back to the deck. Oh yeah, Dan. I was gonna say the key here is we just gotta learn to spell right. That's all. So <laughs> yeah, all right. We have to take a, a a spelling class, and then we'll be able to collaborate a little bit better. But uh, there you go. Uh, yeah. Okay. So what are the important parts of a fluid application? We've got the loader. This is the key thing that enables portability, uh, and it's gonna load the container. Uh, the container is on the next slide, and it is the uh, it is the app layer. It's going to contain the entire state of the app, so like the to-do list. Within that, we've got data objects. We've got at least one data object in every container, but we could have many. And then we've got DDSs, and that's actually what's replicating the state between uh, my machine and Dan's machine and, and your machine. So I pulled the to-do list app out again because I wanted to point out like which part of the fluid system is lined up with which part of this web page. So the loader, it's just included on the page. You pass the loader uh, the address of the service and the unique identifier for this document, and it gives you back the container. And so we can go to the next one. The All of the app code is actually stored in this container. And I think of it as sort of being like a shipping container. It's going to hold all your stuff in it. It's, uh, it's sort of the outer boundary of your application with your code and your data all in one thing. Next, we've got data objects. This application only has one data object, so it's a simple one. I, I whipped it up in an afternoon, uh, but we've got one data object that is holding all of our DDSs, our distributed data structures. We've got one distributed data structure, a shared string, which does the, the title of the to-do, and then we've got a shared sequence, kind of like a list, that does the actual, uh, you know, the, the to-do items. 
And um, there's many more. There's a shared map, there's a shared directory, there's a shared cell. Um, but I chose these two because it, it got me started quickly and I didn't have to worry about any of the merge logic because these DDSs handled it for us. So I think we could sum it up that if something starts with the word shared, we could probably use it almost like a portal in space to, you know, instead of sending a spaceship through the portal, we're sending data through the portal, if you will, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's it's kind of, it's interesting. You know, there, a lot of people do solutions where I'm sending a change to you, but not many people are doing something where, Dan, you'll have the full updated state on your computer. You don't have to handle any of the merge logic. We do that for you. You get a change in, but you also have the full state. You know, you can just say, what are the to-do items that are still in the list? It's uh, take out the trash, get the groceries, prepare for FHL. Uh, you don't have to say, oh, what new to-do did I get? And handle pulling that into your resource. You just get that list kind of completed already. So pretty neat. Super nice, yeah. So with what Sam just went through, the way this works is we need real-time collaboration. So under the covers, it is using WebSockets. But it's very different than something like Socket.io or SignalR because, again, those are more about sending messages. And as Sam just described, we're more about sending ops, we call them, operations, you could say, such as I typed a keystroke, I deleted a to-do, I have a key value pair I want to send. And these are going to be sent over WebSockets, but you as a developer have to know nothing about that layer. That's all managed for you. That's going to go up to a fluid service and tell us a little bit about, you know, the fluid service. Like how much code do I have to write, Sam, for the fluid service? Zero. You don't have to write any code. So this is kind of, this is one of the awesome things. I read all those papers, um, but I sort of hope you don't have to, although I encourage you to. They are interesting papers. The goal, though, is that all you have to do is interact with just the things that are relevant to your application. So for me, just the to-do list, and we take care of taking the change, bringing it through the loader. We've got some driver code. We put it into the WebSocket. We send it off to the service. The service that we were operating against is in Europe. It then sends it back down to Dan. We handle all that for you, all that merge logic, all the WebSocket stuff, and you just have to deal with the state. And uh, there's no service code necessary uh, if you don't want to. Super nice. So one thing I want to point out is we didn't really show it in the demo earlier with the to-do. Uh, but you probably will see it in some of the other demos we're going to run. You'll notice up here there's an ID, and it's uh, we typically call that a document ID. And you'll notice some storage over here. Because if Sam is in a collaborative session, but he joins, let's say, an, a minute late, like he was tied up in another meeting and he caught up a minute later, well, he still needs to be caught up to where we are, obviously. So Fluid will kind of manage all that for you as long as everybody has the same document ID, they can all collaborate on it. And keep in mind, when we say document ID, it's everything from a document to just an app. An app could use this as well. All right, so what we're going to do now that we've kind of introduced some of the main core building blocks is go through a little overview of what would this look like from a code standpoint. Now, I want to emphasize that some of the demos we showed earlier, those were React. Uh, you could do Vue, you could do Angular, you could do Fast. There's all these libraries out there you could use. We're going to uh, do one that is Angular now. So the earlier one uh, with Prosmere was actually React, but this one's going to be uh, Angular. So let's walk them through, Sam, uh, kind of the files that we're going to start talking about. And we're not going to open every single one of these, but we want to show you how this would work. So Sam just talked us through uh, this data object concept. And really, I think of a data object as kind of a, a bucket, if you will, for one or more DDSs. It's like a bundle of DDSs, you could say. So we would need to load our data object, and then we're going to talk about that. So we're going to have a fluid loader service. And then we're going to have this Notero data object. Notero is just the name of this brainstorm app. It's kind of like the code name, if you will. Now, the data object, Sam, that's going to have some shared type of stuff, right? Yeah, will do. It'll have, I guess, yeah. some, probably some DDSs. It'll be one data object plus some DDSs in it. We'll get to that, I guess. Exactly. So what will happen then is as collaborative data flows, 
it would be like this. It'll flow down into, in this case, the Angular app. That can then be passed down into other components. So we have a Notero component that's going to render the demo we're going to show you in just a moment here. And then we can have child components. Um, this is going to be kind of a sticky note demo where we could collaboratively add sticky notes and then vote on them um, as a team, for example. So we might have a pad that allows us to add sticky notes. We might have a board uh, that has all the <clears throat> excuse me, sticky notes themselves. And then we have, <clears throat> I got to clear my throat. And then we have a, a note which represents the sticky notes that would go on the pad or the board here. So to kind of illustrate this, uh, let me show you how this would work. And Sam and I will walk you through the general process. But first, let's go ahead and we already have this loaded up. And what I'm going to do is see this ID right here? That is the document ID. So that's the thing we were talking about earlier. And I'm going to go ahead and paste this into another tab. And let me just, this one's going to be a local demo, by the way. So you can actually develop Fluid apps locally on your machine. And I guess, Sam, we could say you can collaborate amongst yourself, right, in yeah. that case. <laughs> um, but here's an example of a note, like I mentioned earlier, a component. And we can say, all right, well, we want 80s themed game nights at work. I don't know. <laughs> So we say, yeah, sure, share idea. Now watch over here. This would be another user. We'll say instead of Elliot, it's Sam. And we'll go ahead and share that idea. OK, and then Sam comes in and he can add one. And you can type into here too. But he wants uh, motivational posters with cats because, of course, you need that. So we share that idea. And Sam's like, I got to have that one. So he votes on it. And notice over here, we get the vote. And then I'm like, yeah, that is a pretty good idea, Sam. So we add it. <laughs> Right. And now we're going to have like cat posters all over the work, I guess. And then we just keep doing this. Um, we can just instantly collaborate back and forth. And while this demo is sending what I'd argue is messages, keep in mind, we could even add additional functionality to make it where we could edit these sticky notes simultaneously, just like Google Docs, just like Word Online. Um, we could do that same type of functionality. So that's the kind of general idea that we're going to walk you through now. And all those uh, building blocks Sam talked about, we're going to show you how they work. So let's jump on over to the code here. And all right, so this is the actual final version of the product. And what we've done is uh, we'll have some links at the end. So if you want to go in and play with this, you certainly can. Really, all you have to have is Node.js and you're ready to go. You can do an NPM install and an NPM start and you'll be good. Now, this is running a local server. And we're going to talk about that coming up. Um, so Sam mentioned we have one in Europe right now we were hitting. But this one is going to be a development server. It's just for local host uh, so that we could do this development. Now, I'm going to switch branches here. I'm on the main branch. And I'm going to go ahead and switch to a live coding branch. And what we've done is if you'd like to follow along uh, a little bit later, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and stop the server here and we'll get rid of that. If you'd like to follow along, we also at the root of this have a live, live coding markdown file. And uh, that's going to have the info I'm actually going to plug in and Sam's going to kind of walk us through what we're doing. So first things first, um, you're going to notice some packages up here that are probably new to everyone. Um, you're going to see this fluid framework aqueduct, fluid framework map, some core interfaces, things like that. This is a TypeScript project. Um, and then you're also going to notice some RxJS. Now, those that do Angular, you uh, probably have used observables, they're called. If you haven't, an observable is a stream of data. It's like a bunch of cars driving down the road over time, and you can subscribe to watching those cars. Now, the reason I mention that is you'll notice right down here, we have a class called Notero. And this, Sam, is our data object, right? So what exactly, tell me more about the data object there. Yeah, so the data object is something that we offer that makes it a little bit easier to get started building these, these, uh, these objects like Notero. You get a default distributed data structure that we call the root distributed data structure. We give you some lifecycle methods. The first time it's opened, we give you a function for that. Every time it's opened, you get a function for that. And so you've got some nice places where you can plug in your logic 
and this root object to sort of organize all your stuff. So we get things sort of organized for you and hand it back so you can do the interesting stuff. Exactly. Um, and so one of the key things I want you to kind of keep in mind as we walk through this is Sam mentioned you get some kind of root functionality and that's actually a property you're going to see coming up. Um, so kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Now, before we jump into that, though, I want to point out these right here, these two lines. Now, this is specific to RxJS. And uh, RxJS, if you're not familiar, is reactive extensions for JavaScript. It's a way to work with observables. Because think about Sam sending me a keystroke, a keystroke, a keystroke, and he just keeps typing. That's a stream of keystrokes, right? Well, with RxJS, we can subscribe to those and we can expose them to the view. Then the view can update as appropriate as these different DDS pieces of data are coming in, the state, if you will, um, that we're collaborating on. So that's the first piece. Now, if you're not familiar with RxJS at all, don't worry about that. Think of it for now as a pipeline that can have multiple balls flowing through it. So it's almost like I drop a ball, I drop a ball and it rolls down this pipe. That's really what this is. And then the other end of the pipe, we can subscribe using the view. And so we'll come back to that in just a bit here. Now, the first thing we're gonna do is Sam mentioned that uh, data objects are kind of a bundle for DDSs. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab these three things. Um, I could type them if you want, but you know, we don't wanna do that. It's pretty boring typing. Um, these are going to be three properties and Sam, why don't you tell us, I'll get the next one kind of queued up here, but why don't you tell us a little bit about shared maps and how they work. And I don't know. Uh, shared, shared, map uh, are, shared maps are one of our most commonly used distributed data structures. They implement the ES6 map API. So you can use it how you'd expect, like, you can do a get function or a set function on it where you're you know, getting and setting like uh, with, with a key, except because it's a shared map, whatever you do locally will get reflected to every other user. So if I do a set on my machine, Dan will be able to see that set, that set. he'll get that new state on his machine. Uh, and we do that merge logic for you. We send all the data around, but it's all wrapped in kind of a easy to use ES6 map API service. Exactly. So if you've ever used uh, ES6 or ES2015's map or set objects, very, very similar. Um, with the map, again, you can set key value pairs, kind of a dictionary style. And that's exactly what this is. So, you know, if we took off shared here, a lot of you would go, oh, it's just a JavaScript map. Yeah. But by adding shared, this will, in essence, create this portal, if you will, that we can throw stuff in and it magically appears on the other side of the world, and that's the collaborative uh, nature. Now, right now, these aren't that useful on their own. They're just properties, but we're gonna keep working with these. So let's move on down to the next step. Uh, now, Sam, you mentioned, so I'm gonna let you take this part, uh, that data objects give us some lifecycle methods. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so this is the first lifecycle method, initializing first time. This is run the very first time anyone opens up this container with this document ID. And I sort of think of it as being a schema setting function. We get the container ready. We're going to, you know, do some stuff where we make a few shared maps within this data object so that everyone who comes to this later has a set schema that they can understand. So that's what we'll do a shared first time. And um, then in, well, Dan, why don't you talk about create a uh, shared map and how you're using that as a convenience function? Yeah, sure. And then we'll go to the next lifecycle method. Um, so for the Angular folks out there, you might be used to ng on a init, for example. Um, you could almost think of the initializing first time as that, very similar. So as Sam said, if I join first in the collaboration session, I will be the one that initiates this, which means I need to initialize the schema of, you know, what data are we actually going to send? Now, what we did to kind of simplify this is we have a little convenience helper method here, and this is going to create a shared map, and we're going to pass it, and this is from the data object, all right? We're going to pass it something called the runtime. Now, the runtime does a whole bunch of cool stuff, but ultimately it's, and we'll talk about this a little bit at the end, 
but it is going to, uh, in essence, get that op that we talked about off to the server through some other means. But that's why we're passing it the runtime for this. Now, the next thing is if we have these DDSs, distributed data structures, we need to store them for this object and make them known kind of across the collaboration session. So the way we're gonna do that is the data object we extended up top, it has this root property. Remember I said, don't forget that, <laughs> this is it. Um, so Sam mentioned that it has this root functionality that can act kind of like a, a bucket for these DDSs. So we're gonna go ahead and add whatever IDs passed in and then we're gonna give it a reference. This handle is kind of like a pointer, if you will, to the shared map right here. Now, the reason we need that is we're gonna do the following. The first time somebody starts a collaboration session, they're gonna call create shared map. Now the ID would get passed in, so we're gonna create a shared map for notes, votes, and users. And we're breaking that out. We could do one shared map to rule them all, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan. Um, but in this case, we're not gonna do that because it's kind of like separation of concerns. We want notes and votes and users to be sent independently so that we don't kind of step on toes, if you will, or overwrite each other. So that's kind of the first part is we're gonna initialize, but we still haven't tweaked the uh, properties yet, right, Sam? So let's, why don't you tell us about this has initialized now? Yeah, so now we're in the second part of the life cycle. First, we set up a schema. It's only run once. That was the first time initializing. And now we're in has initialized and everyone's going to run this. This is, you know, both the first person they run it. Every time anyone loads up this state, they're going to run this because they're going to get the schema back. And so we've now populated our notes map, our votes map and our users map by going to the root, passing in the relevant ID and getting that object out. And this is where we're going to eventually be able to set up an event listener to interact with our view. And so we've got our maps. That means we've got all of our state. We, we've just pulled it in. We've got access to it now, but we've got to plumb our state and connect it to our view. And we'll do that next. Yeah, so to kind of walk through a little more detail on this, the root again is what we set up here, right? Pretty simple. This is now going to get the handle. Remember, we said map.handle. Well, this is the key. So it's like, kind of like, give me the handle for notes. Give me the handle for votes. And then this get here will kind of reach in, find that handle, and then get us back the actual DDS. You'll see with TypeScript here, if I mouse over it, it's actually a shared map. Again, just like a getter setter map in JavaScript, but distributed um, across you know, the world if you had collaborators <laughs> around the world. So that's kind of what this is doing. Now, one thing I want to point out here is this is a TypeScript demo and we're using all the generics, like all the bells and whistles are being used. You don't have to though. Um, if you're working with just pure JavaScript, then you know you don't have generics. That's what this is right here. And you wouldn't have to use that. So if you're not familiar with that concept, don't let it you know intimidate you at all. If you're, if you're using TypeScript, you're probably like, oh, that's awesome because we get strong typing. It works out really well. Now, as Sam mentioned, we need to come in and uh, we need to add the ability to listen because if each of these is a way to send data to multiple collaborators, how do I know when Sam types something or deletes something or adds something, right? We need to listen for incoming data uh, from the Fluid Framework. So what we're gonna do here is jump down to this and you're gonna notice that we have several different events here. Um, so Sam, walk us through like value change is probably a little more obvious to folks, but you know, what are we doing here with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was saying before in has initialized, we're setting ourselves up to connect our state to our view. And this is actually where we're making that connection. So we are creating event listeners where we say on this shared map, has anything changed? And if it has, we need to emit a, uh, an event so that the rest of the angular view system can pull that in value changed in particular that just means someone add an id uh or they changed the value associated with an id remember this is just a map so if anyone does a set we want to know about it and we want all the people in the session to know about it too so this value changed event is specifically just 
propagating this information so that everyone's going to know uh, that there was an update to the shared map. Similarly, we've got you know the clear. That's where you would remove all the data from a shared map. Um, we've got this quorum shared object. This is another DDS that we haven't talked about yet. It does some other stuff like keep track of the people in your session, show you the participants, who else is logged on with you, and there's add member, remove member. Uh, we don't need to get into quorum, but it's documented on foodframework.com. Uh, yeah, so this is how we, we set up our view and connect to the Angular system. Now, uh, just as a reminder, when we go way up top here, I mentioned that because we're in an Angular app, we're kind of doing it the Angular way, which is to send a stream of data. Remember I said it's like a, it's almost like a pipeline. And when a piece of data comes in, I don't know, I think of it like a ball. I don't know if that's a, a good analogy or not, but that's how I think of it. And it gets dropped in the pipe and then it kind of rolls down to the subscriber, which is going to be the view. We'll get to that. So the way we're going to trigger anybody that kind of is on the end of this pipe and the dollar, if you're not familiar with that, it's a Node.js convention that's often used to represent a stream of data. So notice if we come on down, we're going to use this thing called a subject to actually send whatever data we want. Now we're only sending the name of the event. And then the view you're going to see in just a moment is going to subscribe to that. Sam would get it, for instance, and say, oh, the value changed. And then Sam can go in and go grab the updated notes or the votes or the users, whatever he wants. And that's what we have going on there. Now, the last little piece is we talked about how a DDS, like a shared map, is really, really similar API wise to a map in JavaScript. And so I'm going to add just one little thing that you'll also find in this readme we have if you want to follow along on your uh, own leisure, in your own leisure time. So when they create a note, so remember in the demo, if we came on uh, back over to here, I clicked on something and then I shared it. Well, to send that to all the collaborators, this is all you have to do. It's really simple. So the first thing is we say, hey, do we have any text? Because obviously if we don't, we don't want to send it, but we're going to create a note here. So we just have a ID, the text, and then a user. Um, and then here's how we send it right here. We just say, all right, go to that DDS, call set, give it a, a unique identifier, and then give it the data. And voila, it uh, <laughs> kind of kicks off the portal, if you will. And it's almost like uh, if you're a Star Trek fan, it's like beam me up, Scotty, and we can beam Scotty from this planet to this planet. And that's what we're doing with this note behind the scenes anyway. Now, if we move on down, you'll also see, if you remember in the demo, you can also vote on things. Um, same story here. We have a delete API if you want to delete a vote. If you want to add a vote, we have a set API. There's a get API. Um, all these types of APIs can be used to uh, read it. All right, so that is, as a developer, Sam, isn't this pretty much where you'd focus most of your time when it comes to Fluid anyway? Yeah, this is where you'd spend a lot of your time, which is exactly what you want to do. Very little setup, very little coordination or thinking. You're just putting your data in and then you're pulling your data out and you're sending it to your view. Just what you want, but it's all low latency, so it's pretty cool. Yeah, and you know, really the only tricky part, once you learn the APIs, is just setting it up. And this is kind of code that is going to be very similar across all Fluid apps. So once you see it and learn it once, you kind of have it. It's almost like a broken record, if you will. <laughs> All right, so um, to go on back just real quick here, we let's kind of have a you are here refresher. So we just covered this Notero data object that can send data back and forth between collaborators. We need to load the data object, so we're going to talk about this loader. And then the rest of these, these are just components. Now, Again, this is an Angular app, but you know React has components, Svelte has components, Vue has components. Everything these days is components. <laughs> so most of what we're going to show you from here on out isn't so much Fluid as it is just getting to the data that Fluid uh, provides us. That's what's kind of cool about this and neat. All right, so let's move to the app component. Now, the first thing is we have that loader you saw in the diagram. In fact, let me just, we're kind of done with that. So let's get rid of that one. And uh, I'm going to have Sam walk us through 
you know, what is this loader and what are its capabilities? We're doing a more simplified use of it here, but it can also do some really cool stuff too. So let me go ahead and jump to that. And Sam, you want to tell us there's really just two lines of code, right? That we're doing. Yeah, here. no, I'd love to tell you about it. If you remember from earlier on, we had those, you know, concentric circles. We had that one green circle, the loader. We didn't talk that much about it because it's not really a main part of getting, of playing with the data. It's about attaching to the data and getting access to it. And so what we have here is the get tinylicious function on line 25. Uh, we're passing in your document ID. And it's that unique identifier we keep talking about and a few other small things. And we get back the container. That container includes our app state uh, and includes the code that you saw in that data object. So it's a kind of a code plus a data package that enables that portability. Uh, it has the word tinylicious in it. And that tinylicious word is referring to the test service that uh, Dan is operating against. It's running locally. But when I ran the to-do list app, we were connecting to that service in Europe. And you would just change a few lines within that function, but that's the kind of boilerplate we also want to take care of you for you. In line 28, we're getting the default data object out. So this is, we take the container and we get the uh, Notero data object out, which is going to give us access to that Angular event infrastructure that Dan was talking about. It's going to set up our initial schema, call that has initializing function, and all that other stuff that Dan will, will sort of show us how we use as we get into the, the Angular code base. Yeah, so this part is fluid related because this again, as Sam just said, goes into that loader and container. And now we're just getting the data object out. Uh, I wanna throw in one more thing. We're just loading this locally because data object is in this app. It doesn't have to be. Um, this could actually be up on a CDN and you could actually dynamically load this type of code. We're not gonna have time to go into that today, but that is a, a really powerful feature of Fluid for embedding, you could say dynamic collaborative apps. You can oh, you know what, Dan? Well. Let me just say this, because yeah. I think it's interesting. You know, we sure. were looking at the Fluid Framework Playground earlier on, and how, how do you think we loaded stuff there? We actually did something really similar. We used the get, I think we used <coughs> uh, a different get container function, but we used a really similar one to, to pull that pros mirror container, open it up on that website and put those two things side by side. Uh, yeah, Dan's showing you the demo again. So we did that using the same thing. We're just loading things dynamically. We're hitting a service here that's actually in your browser uh, instead of being on the local machine or in Europe, wherever it may be. Um, but using the same infrastructure, that's how we accomplish this. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I'm gonna show one more thing while we're here because we yeah, do can't. It. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. This is our time. You know, a lot of us are line of business developers, and how many times have you had somebody working on a grid where somebody saved something, but they didn't realize somebody else was working on it, and you know, you step on uh, the data, and then now you got to worry about optimistic concurrency or pessimistic or whatever. And I've been on a lot of apps where it actually matters if you saw the latest data. So just to show you real quick, you know, again, you could do this for many scenarios. I mean, we could even change column names. You can see my lovely names here, but we'll say we want that call to, this is finance or something. And in this case, as I lose focus, it's updating, but you could also have it where they could even type in the same cell. Uh, that would be called a shared strength. Now notice this one's called a shared matrix because this is kind of a table uh, column and row type scenario. So I just want to point out that there's a lot of cool scenarios. I mean, you could even place a collaborative Sudoku if you want. We're not going to do that, but <laughs> you could if you want. So all right, so moving on, um, let's jump to the final part of the story here, which is once we have Fluid going, uh, you know, what, what happens from there in the Angular or the React or the Vue app? So let's say that Sam did this part of the code and he gave me back the data object. Well, now we need to get that data object into the view so that we can subscribe. And remember, we had the observable stream, the pipe with the balls that flow through it. Well, what we're doing is we're passing that to a component called app Notero. And you'll see that's passed. This data object is passed as we're just calling it the model. Um, and for those that are in Angular, this is called an input binding. If you're not familiar with it and you've done React or Vue, uh, you'd call these a, a prop a property. 
Now that's going to pass down into Notero, and uh, Sam kind of emphasized quite a bit on the hey, you got to listen for data. So hey, Sam, guess what we're doing right there? Oh, we're listening. <laughs> oh, I, wow. This is why Sam is such a genius, but yeah. <laughs> he is. Um, yeah, this is the change. If we go back to the data object real quick here, remember up top we had this change dollar, and then Sam walked us through every time a value changes, we could send a value through this change dollar. That's done through this thing called a subject. So what we're doing here is we're subscribing to any changes, and then that calls this change function. Now, in this case, we're not really using the values that were passed in. So it passed like value changed or member added and stuff like that. We're just saying every time there's a change, let's go grab from the DDSs the latest notes, the latest what's your username, who are the other users involved? Let's go grab all that. Now, if we say let's go see what is you know the get notes here do. Well, get notes is just going to use the DDS. Okay. And in fact, notice we're just going to loop through the notes shared map and we're going to get those notes and we're going to push them and return them. And now what's going to happen is those, these notes user users, they will be passed into some uh, child components. So again, whether you're doing Vue, Angular, React, Svelte, it doesn't really matter. It's the same concepts where we have properties we want to pass in. And then these others like pad, it would be responsible for uh, rendering things like that note text area that you could either type in or select there. So I won't uh, go into all these details because really this now is just to the level of as the user loses focus or types a keystroke, we're gonna cause an event to fire. But ultimately what will happen is when they click the button, the uh, Notero will send that note up to the fluid service and then it broadcasts that out to Sam and you and everybody that's involved here. All right, anything else to add to that part, Sam, before we move on here? Well, I guess just to orient everyone, I, I think the next thing we're gonna talk about is hosting fluid apps, right? Yeah. So we're gonna get back into that little bit of code that uh, we were showing with the get tiny licious container but we're gonna show it at uh, a more conceptual level and we'll talk about why it's important and why it's useful. So we're looking at hosting uh, fluid apps here. You've got three uh, of the same container. They've all got the same ID here. Uh, they're all connecting to the fluid service via WebSockets and those WebSockets are just being used to send ops. The fluid service is storing things in our storage and it's handling stuff. But I want to call out a few a few interesting things about this picture uh, that, that we're excited about. So the first is all you have to focus on as a developer is the view and the data object. We handle all of the rest. The second is that this is a really efficient picture. You're sending just the operations, just the changes to the fluid service, and the fluid service is just ordering those operations. So this is, you know, Dan mentioned a total order broadcast. This is a key part of how we make CRDTs, our merge technology, more memory efficient. We order those operations from zero to N uh, or zero to a million. Every time we get a new op, we just sort of throw it at the end of the list. And then we send the new operation back with that ordering, with that total ordering to the containers. And those containers can rearrange uh, the incoming ops and make the final state. So I just am sort of talking to you about what is the server doing in the process of making this state system work for you? It's just taking op ops in, it's sending ops back. That's all it has to do. And all you have to worry about is your distributed data structures, your shared map, your shared sequence, your shared matrix. You get those for free with the fluid service here. Um, and because of this structure, we can have one, two, three collaborators We've done tests with hundreds and thousands of collaborators, and we see very little impact on latency, um, which is excellent because our latency is really top notch already. And to be able to scale that broadly is a really powerful feature. So we're really excited yeah. about that. And and Sam, I mean, Fluid could have done it where the server merged all the things coming in, but that of course would add to the latency, right? Yeah. So 
with the clients doing the merge, the way I like to think of it, folks, because most of you are probably used to like get and file merges, right? When you uh, do a poll or a push or whatever you're doing with Git, it's almost like a Git merge on all the clients as it gets these ops, but it's not Git, of course, it's fluid, but it's using these algorithms in the browser or wherever the JavaScript is running to actually do the merge. And that's why the latency is so low is because as Sam said, really the server is just kind of like a stamper going, okay, you're number one, number two, number three, number four, and then it just passes them. And then the client knows how to magically merge it. And that's the tricky part I talked about earlier where we had all those white papers hanging on the on Sam's uh, board there. So yeah. well, tell us a little bit more, Sam. Um, we have a little more here on the Fluid service, right? Because we got to communicate with them. Right. Yeah, we do. There's one thing I wanted to say here because I, I think this you 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 are always good about bringing this up. It's you know these are all we're looking at these as if they're all web browsers. They're all you know views of the data. But you could take one of these uh, one of these pages here, one of these containers, and measure, and it would run exactly the same way. So if you want to have processes where you own the computer, maybe you're doing. Uh, some machine learning algorithm, you need a little bit more processing power on that machine, or you, you're really latency sensitive. Well, you can run a flu, an instance of a fluid container in the service, and it works exactly the same, but you get that low latency that we're striving for. So uh, we think that's a pretty good set of trade-offs, and um, we love it when people run fluid in the cloud without having a view uh, of, that, of that state. All right, we can go to the yep. next thing and talk about the driver model, I think. Yeah. Let's move onward and upward. All right. So I'll let Sam talk about the driver, but remember earlier I mentioned that we did shared map.create and then we passed it this dot runtime. And I said there's actually a little bit more to the story with runtime. You don't have to know about it, thankfully. Fluid does it. But yeah, take it from here, Sam, and tell us how that kind of the runtime ultimately gets those ops to the fluid service. Yeah, for sure. So this is a uh, a mostly accurate picture here where we're talking about the flow of state change throughout the system. So we'll start by looking at the DDSs in the very middle. You make a change to those DDSs and it flows to the right and the runtime figures out where those changes need to go. It does some merge stuff for you and ultimately it sends it uh, to the driver. And we've got a pluggable driver model where you can change out the service that you interact with. So you could use a managed service that we intend to roll out later in the year you could use a self-hosted service uh, or a service that you build your, your on, on your own. That would all be fine. But whatever you build, the driver has to send that change to the service for it to get stamped, as Dan was describing before. Uh, it has to get stored so that we can remember it in case someone new joins. And then it goes all the way back down that path through the driver, back to the runtime, and back to the DDS so that you can update your view, as you can see the left part of this picture. And so... That's the overall flow of state of the system. So a few things I'm calling out here. One is the loader includes a driver model. Uh, so you've got this pluggable system. Uh, this is an important part of our flexible and open source strategy. Make sure that people can bring their own services and, and get creative with uh, how you're loading in fluid data. Uh, we don't wanna you know, lock you into any particular situation. You should be able to bring your own drivers there. And uh, and yeah, that's the op flow through the system, including including the uh, the service. Yeah, and I want to emphasize one more time, as we've already said it, that the runtime and the driver normally will say nine times out of ten. You don't even worry about it. Um, you could just use what Fluid provides, set things up, and you're good to go. Most of us are going to be worrying about, as developers anyway, about the data object and the DDSs, like we described in the Notero brainstorm demo. Although that's a pretty good transition because we are looking for people who to contribute to the service. And if you are interested in this stuff, feel free to you know add to our repository. I'll, you, you can take over the open source stuff, Dan. No, it's all good. No, exactly. I mean, that, that's our, gonna be our wrap up here. So uh, as we mentioned, I think at the start we mentioned, if not, we'll tell it again. Um, Fluid was open sourced in September. And uh, as a result, it's it's been worked on a whole bunch inside of Microsoft. It's being used for a bunch of things that we won't have time to go into here. Uh, but it is open sourced. And uh, from a feedback standpoint, as Sam just mentioned, 
we're really interested in gathering that feedback, whether it's bugs you find, uh, API suggestions, feature suggestions, uh, pull requests, you know, that, hey, I want a new driver. I want to be able to hit X or Y or Z. Then that should be a capability. So uh, one of the nice things, Sam, wanted to wrap up here. Why don't you tell us about, you know, the service right now, we can stand it up on our own, right? That is possible, but some things are coming down the road, right? Yeah, so, you know, we don't have all the details yet, but we intend to release a managed service that's based on the open source offering. Right now, the open source project has a few things. We've got some example repositories. We've got some examples that are actually a little harder to use that are in the Fluid Framework repository itself. We've got the runtime code, the loader code, and we've got this self-hostable service that you can run. And we're going to we're going to offer a managed version of that on Azure uh, at some point later on. And we're really excited about it. We think it'll make it much easier to get started with Fluid. Yeah, because then you literally wouldn't even, number one, you don't ever have to write code for the service, but now <laughs> yeah. you don't even have to up your own. Uh, you just worry about the JavaScript side and the rest is taken care of. So very nice. Yes. Well, all right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, Sam, it's been great talking with you. Uh, lots of great information. So, you know, where can we get more info? Well, we showed you fluidframework.com. Um, if you're on Twitter, feel free to follow Sam at Sam Broner or myself, Dan Walleen. Uh, we tweet about mostly technical stuff. So if you're interested in that, uh, take a look. Now, if you're interested in uh, some kind of basic stuff, really basic, we didn't show this, but there's a fluid hello world. It's a dice roller type collaborative scenario. Uh, Sam's demo, he put together of the to-do. You can go check that out. And then the uh, Angular demo, you can find that in my repo. And there's also some other demos of collaborative text areas in Angular uh, and the kind of hello world demo there if you want to go to this fluid Angular. In addition to that, uh, there's examples now in Vue at that repo, uh, a web component library called Fast, which is very cool. I like it a lot. And then the Fluid repo itself, which you can get to fluidframework.com. Uh, that's where, Sam, we can go for issues and PRs and all that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm monitoring, you know, I'm, I'm on Twitter, obviously, reach out there, but Stack Overflow, we're there. We're very responsive on issues. We just open sourced a couple of, you know, a month and a half ago. And the most important thing for me is getting your feedback and, and having you learn more about it, teaching you more about it, getting you involved. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So with that, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, we hope you get a chance to play with Fluid and hope that gets you thinking about collaboration. So we appreciate you tuning in. And uh, I believe we, I don't know, we'll have to see if we have any questions, I guess. Then. Absolutely. Yeah, it was so much fun to do this. Let's see if we got questions. Maybe um, does someone from Dev Day uh, want to help us with that or sh um, should we read them off ourselves? Uh, hi, Sam. Hi, Dan. Uh, actually, we hi. have received uh, quite a few questions. So Great. I'll read them to you so that you can answer. Um, so first of all, uh, someone is asking, can we use Fluid standalone with no dependencies on other services? You can, uh, you know, so that managed service that we're talking about, it um, there isn't, it doesn't exist yet. And so if you want to run Fluid right now, you'll be self-hosting code from the open source library and you can do with that whatever you'd like. The only dependencies are the dependencies in that repository. Maybe there's a few other Docker containers that you pull in like MongoDB, but it's a self-hostable thing that you could run on your own Kube cluster, Docker Swarm, et cetera, if you wanted to get started and run your own service. Yeah, and, and down the road, that's where this uh, hosted service will play a role, but like Sam says, not not quite ready yet. Exactly, yeah. That would have no other dependencies. I should be clear, but uh, but right now it's self-hosted, which also has no dependencies, but it has the dependency of, I guess, you doing the work to host it, which could be, uh, well, wait, so that, that's the answer. Okay, uh, so next on, Sahan is asking, can we, uh, can we use current Fluid to develop large-scale enterprise applications? You could. Um, the I think the big thing there is what we just talked about, though. Um, you are going to have to, at this point, as of today, uh, stand up your own fluid service. And that part, as Sam mentioned, there is a little more to that because normally you're going to use Docker containers and things like that for 
the service part. Um, the client part and all this merging logic we've talked about, this is actually being used very heavily inside of Microsoft, and I won't go into all the details there, but it's something that's been worked on for quite a while. And Sam, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I do. So Microsoft, we are well known for running large scale enterprise products. And we have right now a product that's in uh, beta testing called Fluid Preview. You can see it at fluidpreview.com if you have an enterprise license. Um, that's built entirely with Fluid. So we trust it enough to build that kind of application. And I hope that inspires you to trust it enough to base some other application on it. Uh, and I think it will work well. Well, and to add to that, that fluid preview, that's pretty much any time like Sam and I or any other team members need to live collaborate on a doc, we pretty much go to fluid preview and do that. And you can at mention people, which kind of emails them and lets them know to come collaborate. And there's all kinds of fun stuff you can do. So, yeah. Okay, so next one, Gan is asking, what kind of UI frameworks can we use along with Fluid? Are there any browser limitations to this? Dan, why don't you take this one? Uh, any modern browser is going to work. Um, I don't know. Does it? Have we tried on IE9, Sam? <laughs> like IE9 or 10? I don't know. I don't I've think, never tried on IE9. I think you might have to re-implement the WebSocket driver, but once you did that, you'd probably be all right. Yeah. So in We'll, we'll assume that most people are on a pretty modern browser and not some of these more ancient ones. Uh, the short answer is anything that runs JavaScript, including Node.js on the server side, uh, could actually run Fluid. So that means we did Angular, the uh, table demo we did, and the Prosmere demo we did, the live typing. Those were React. I mentioned uh, up on my repo, there's some uh, view demos, some fast, which is a web component library demos, uh, and others will be coming. So yeah, you can use it with anything you can think of as long as it can run JavaScript, you should be good to go there. Okay, uh, so next on, uh, someone is asking, can we use Selenium or other similar UI testing tools along with Fluid? Mm, that's a really good question. I. You definitely can, uh, and I think it's a great thing to do. What we haven't done, though, is we haven't built the hooks that you might expect in other uh, view languages to, sorry, other view frameworks to work with Selenium. Mm -hmm. And that's because we are agnostic to the view framework. We expect that this kind of Selenium or other UI testing tool would work pretty much just how it would work with Angular or React or anything like that. So. Um, if that answers your question, we expect it to work the same as it kind of already does. I'm not sure if you'd call this to be a, a UI testing tool, but on the playground, we were actually integrating Storybook, which is something I know people use to sort of double check that views look similar. And we integrated with that and it worked really nicely. So I'd expect you to have a similar experience integrated with Selenium. Yeah, and if, if anyone uses Cypress, which is kind of my go-to end to end, um, same story there. In fact, I'd argue it'd be even easier and it works extremely well, so. Okay, uh, so next on, is it possible to create custom strategies to handle update collisions to the distributed data structure? That's Good an question. awesome question. Sam, I, I love that Sam's question. That one, he reads all yeah. those white papers. You know? <laughs> I, uh, so that's a, that's a really deep question. There's a few things there. One is, um, a resounding yes. That's the kind of thing where we'd love to get pull requests on that. If I were to translate that question into maybe how I would say it, I would say, can I make a new distributed data structure with merge logic that does something a little bit different? And the answer is totally yes. We think that's a great thing to do. Building new CRDT-like distributed data structures can be kind of challenging. So we built an initial group that we think is powerful enough to accomplish most goals, but there's still some things that I know we can't quite do. And so we're looking to have custom strategies to handle collisions. I wanna be careful with the word collisions though, because in CRDTs, one of the things you're doing is you're actually preventing collisions. So I'm gonna do a little case study on the map and I don't wanna go too deep here, but there isn't really a collision because at op 10, 
Dan might insert uh, like a certain value at a certain key. That's the way it is at op 10. At op 11, if I insert a different value at the same key, there's no collision. I'm just writing over him. And so that kind of collisionless thing is really a merge strategy. So you can write a new merge strategy, but you probably aren't explicitly handling a collision because our goal is to prevent collisions. CRDTs are conflict-free resolution data types that don't have those kind of collisions. Anyway, great question. Love to hear it. We need CRDTs for humans, you know? That'd be kind of nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> no conflicts would be fantastic. <laughs> no <though>. conflicts. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, guys, so I saved this one for last, actually. How is the future of Fluid looking going forward? What more can we expect for this framework? Well, oh it's exciting. Uh, Sam has actually, I said this earlier and I actually meant it. Sam's been part of the team longer than I think just about anyone. So I'm going to let him take that one because he has worked with it by far the longest. <laughs> oh, man, I, you know, uh, it's tough to say what the future will hold because we're right now getting all this feedback from people about you know what direction we should go in and we're excited about where we are now the next steps are just keep making it better there's a lot of really interesting academic research how do you get even better at handling state changes and there's a lot of really interesting places to go with user feedback like how to make it easier to interop with Vue, react angular etc how do we make our service more powerful? So the next year for us is keep working on this, but we know the future is bright. Microsoft's starting to take bets on this. We've got that fluid preview application that I mentioned earlier and a few other services coming out. So you can expect exciting updates over the course of the next six months, year, uh, 18 months, and, and I'm excited to, to be there for that. And I'll, I'll wrap one final thing to add to that is one of the reasons I decided to join Microsoft was uh, I kind of had a, a pitch, if you will, about this position, and I heard more about Fluid, and it was exciting enough that I said, hey, this is this is something that looks really, really uh, nice and uh, really something the future needs, I think, because as I started the talk off with, if 2020 has shown us anything, it's that, first off, we're all pretty good at working distributed, as we've had to, but I think it's also shown us the maybe the gaps in collaborative technologies. And this kind of fills some of those gaps. So that's pretty exciting, I think. 